Hi, Kara. Hi, Fatih. How are you? Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm okay because I haven't been able to come to a KubeCon talk yet. So that makes me a bit stressed. But how are things with you? They're, um, they're fine. <laughs> a little busy. I have to do the KubeCon talk as well. But um, I'm quite excited about it. I think it should be a really good one. So. Yeah, it's the same with me. Like I've been trying for these four years and when it happened, I became like stressed. <laughs> That's going to be great. <laughs> We've already kind of done one version. So, yeah. yeah, but this is like, you know, first time wasn't the first time. So it was like, I'm used to that. But this one is like bigger. I'll see. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Hello, Emil. Hello, Remy. Hey. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, Vincent. Thank you for joining us. Hello. I am looking forward to seeing your presentation for the second time. First time it was so good, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Good. Um, great. Well, welcome to today's interoperability SIG meeting. Vincent Behar is going to give a presentation on, tell me if I'm describing this correctly, on um, using Jenkins X to gather metrics on using the door metrics and Nicole Fartran's new space metrics um, developed with her GitHub team. And we have a link in the notes um, to the paper that they've just written. So that'll give you some background on these new metrics, so that'll be really exciting. But first, let me um, share my screen and we'll go over just some of our admin, some of our, some of our more. Oh, no. Okay, no, hold on a second, sorry. Um, Great, we'll go over, I think the action items we have for today's meeting, um, if we look, Steve to, Steve to add uh, artifact metadata. And I believe Steve has done this. So we're in really, really good shape with that. Um, so I think that one can be crossed out. And then Fatih and Tracy have updated the SIGS meeting so that it's at 1500 UTC, which it is right now. So we should be fine there as well. Uh, any other action items or things to add to the agenda that are not already on there? Okay, <laughs> great. So let's, um, let's look at the artifact metadata work that we have now and Steve, are you on the call? Yes. Awesome. So I will let you uh, speak to what you have added to this. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, well, if you just, since you're sharing, just go ahead and uh, scroll down and I'll yeah. kind of. This is all Jenkins X stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So go up a little bit and there we go, artifacts. So I kind of broke it down into um, uh, five uh, types of artifacts, and um, this is not the definitive list. And if we need to change uh, any of this, I'm totally open to it. Um, one of the first one is the, more of the traditional file artifact that we think of, um, like a jar file, ear file, where those get pushed to a um, some sort of repository, artifactory, nexus, uh, maven repository. Um, and when they get pushed to those uh, uh, artifact repositories, they're going to have certain attributes around them. Um, and mainly, you know, the basic stuff around a file. Uh, one of the things that d does happen in those repositories 
it, for the artifacts is they're categorized not only um, uh, based on the name, but also they'll have some sort of version uh, tag or commit that's associated with them. Um, so that uh, version tag and commit can be, uh, you can have multiple ones of those pointing to the same um, artifact version. So you'll see like, you'll have like a snapshot or it'll then get transformed from a snapshot to a release candidate. And then it'll get transformed to, from release candidate to the, the final version. So there is uh, some transformation. The, um, these artifact repositories are not uh, uh, immutable. Um, they can, like the tags can be changed and things like that. You can go and replace a version. So that's one of the things that we just have to be aware of on the file artifacts side. Um, on the next one, the database artifact. Hang on. All right, sorry. Um, the database artifact is something that we have in Ortelius. Um, and the concept behind a database artifact is uh, it comes in two pieces. You're gonna have two file, um, basically two file uh, artifacts, one for a roll forward and one for a roll back. Um, both of those are typically different file names. Um, I, I, an example of a roll forward is I'm gonna add a column uh, to a table and the rollback is going to be dropping that column that I just added. What this allows is uh, databases act in an incremental up, uh, way when you need to update them. So you have to go through your whole um, versioning uh, of the tables um, and apply all the different versions in the right order. If you want to roll back, you have to roll back all the versions in uh, in order to, to jump from one, one place to another place in the uh, uh, to get to the right state of the, the database. So <clears throat> it's something that we have in or Ortelius, um, this, this concept of a database artifact um, with the two different roll forward, roll back pieces. Um, the versioning of this, um, where this can be stored can be in a Git repo um, or it could be in like an artifactory repo is just a plain file, um, those type of things. So that's, uh, but it do, they do need to go in pairs uh, as part of that uh, logic. So the next one is the container image artifact. Um, basically this one, I did not go into the um, deep down into the contents of a container. I looked at um, once a container has been built, um, that we're going to do something with that built image. Um, and usually that gets pushed to a, a registry. Um, and that registry is where uh, you can retrieve it from. Registries uh, can be either public or private. They'll have um, an organization uh, as part of the naming convention. You know, so this this image uh, belongs to this organization. Uh, it has a specific uh, name and it's tagged and there is a digest that's associated with it. Um, one of the interesting things with uh, container images is that you don't get a digest until it's been pushed to a registry. So you can't have a digest for a locally built uh, image um, unless you have a local registry. So if I do like a Docker build, I'm not gonna have a digest, which is one of the things. And these are immutable. Um, as part of that, so we'll never get the, the duplicate on, on that uh, that point. So that's one of the nice things with the, the, the container images is they're immutable. Um, the tags though, um, tagging, you can re-tag something. So you can't uh, trust a tag to be the definitive go-to for, um, if you're gonna do like reporting, um, you'd wanna be moving and, or tracking the digest uh, the digest is going to be, be the link that we need to focus on. Um, so the tag, uh, and I've run into this with one of our customers where they've re-tagged the image about a dozen times um, as it moves through the pipeline. <clears throat> the next one is an endpoint artifact. Um, 
uh, endpoint is like a loose term I'm trying to use there. If somebody has a better idea of, of something other than endpoint, just feel free. But what I'm trying to gather here is um, uh, something that uh, a target that we deploy to. Um, it could be a server, it could be a physical server, it could be a virtual, a VM, it could be EC2 instance, a Kubernetes cluster, it could be, uh, you know, AWS Lambda uh, function, you know, we're going to go somewhere inside of uh, uh, this world. And what I'm trying to gather here for an endpoint artifact is what is the definition of the endpoint? You know what is making up the endpoint, um, and so in the case of like on the the uh, Kubernetes um, uh, kind of cloud provider side, there we're going to have something like a Terraform or CloudFormation, some sort of YAML file that's going to describe what the endpoint is going to look like, um, and that that YAML uh, JSON definition is what I was thinking that we would uh, be using um, in the our, uh, our repository that you can always go back to. So if you wanna go recreate a uh, an endpoint, you go pull it from the repository and then run the appropriate program against that file to go ahead and um, create that endpoint as part of that process. Now, physical machines, it gets a little, uh, more difficult because we're not necessarily uh, pulling together uh, bare bones, but there are tools out there that can bootstrap a bare bones um, uh, hardware. And then finally, uh, the hardware artifact. Um, this really is describing or trying to describe um, the different pieces of hardware that are actually on uh, a machine that we're gonna be working with. Um, this one is more of a, what I would call uh, a representation or a reporting of a hardware artifact versus a way to stand up a new hardware artifact. Because um, you have to actually, if you want to stand up a new piece of hardware, you actually have to have somebody physically go put in a graphics card. You have to go, somebody go physically put in a, a disk drive. So this is more the long lines of reporting uh, for hardware artifacts. Um, and there could be a disconnect uh, as, part of, uh, as part of what a technician is doing to a machine. They go and swap out a graphics card and they don't put a new one in that's exactly the same as the old one. They have a slightly different um, model or whatever. So we could end up with drift um, at the hardware level, um, and that would be need to be addressed. But if we're looking at pulling together everything as a whole, um, you know, from the, the base level hardware all the way up through cloud, up to um, databases, uh, contain, uh, you know, uh, container images and files, um, that's what I was trying to achieve here uh, at that level. Um, and if there's anything I missed, feel feel free to go ahead and uh, uh, change it. Uh, this is just my initial thought of where we could start. Any questions? This is great, Steve. Thank you so much for adding it. Do we have any comments or questions for Steve? I actually have, which is related to the SPDX topics as well. Uh, Steve, as you know, uh, we have been mailing back and forth. So maybe I can talk about what this SPDX thing about and then follow up with the question. And then Steve, if you could, you know, share your thoughts on this, that would be great. Okay. So uh, I actually, like Steve, you actually, uh, I think highlighted SPDX when we first time started discussing standardized metadata, like in December or something. Mm -hmm. I have been casually looking at SPDX and browsing Linux Foundation site and other places. And I noticed an announcement on uh, Linux Foundation site, which I put the link there. And it seems Linux Foundation submitted SPDX spec uh, as a candidate to become a standard as part of ISO. 
And then I found the draft spec on ISO sites. And if you go there, uh, Kara, so it's preview, like you have to pay to get the full draft, it seems. But it seems it's in progress. And also, when I was watching uh, the uh, presentation by Jim Zemlin during Linux Foundation Spring member meeting, which I put the link there as well, he mentions that SPDX accepted as international standard for how open source metadata is shared. So this made me think that maybe we should, you know, get in touch with SPDX folks and to learn more about what they are doing, what this standard consists of, and perhaps get someone from SPDX to join one of our meetings. And thanks to Tracy, Tracy Miranda, we got in touch with uh, Kate Stewart from SPDX. So she will join our meeting uh, in two weeks on 15th of April, but perhaps it would be good to get your opinion about this, Steve, because I've seen some file artifact stuff in that spec as well, and how much overlap is there, or what are the gaps between what SPDX is proposing and what we are trying to, you know, work with. Right. So um, let me see if I can find it real quick. So one of the things um, that SPDX uh, actually focuses on is one of their main goals when they, that I can see that they kind of started out is with is what, what software license is a particular package written against? So is it Apache, Apache 2? You know, there's about, it seems like hundreds of them. Um, and that was the main goal was to gather in the initial um, licenses because that's what everybody wanted to know. That's what the attorneys wanted to know uh, was what was the licenses uh, that are being used. So, um, and I've been following SPDX for years now. Uh, I remember them in introducing it to the Linux Foundation probably six years ago. Um, as part of that. So one of the things that, let me share my screen if I could. Yes. Jeez, let me get out of the way. So um, what I found was the version one of the spec is a lot easier to follow than the version two. Um, the version two is taking it to a new level and it, just to get the idea of what they were thinking uh look at the version one um the documentation is just laid out i think a little bit easier to follow um one of the things that this is referring to is around let's say we have a python module or um for this python module I need to create certain uh, package information around that Python module. Now, when we get to a uh, container, a container, let's say we're doing a Python Flask application in a container, we're gonna have many um, Python modules installed. So we're gonna have many uh, SPDX files, one for each package should be there. Same thing like Node.js, um, there's gonna be one for each Anything you bundle up um, and you push out to, uh, you know, like to PyPy or any of those, anytime you do your packaging, this is where they're um, basically requiring you now to uh, give us some basic information. The main thing, like I said, is uh, the license. Everybody wants to know the license. Everything else is pretty much optional from what I could tell. Um, and like you're saying, there's, let me see if I can find it real quick. There is, here's package information. Um, this is where the overlap really comes into play. Um, you know, like what's the package name? You know, how are, how is it being described? Uh, what is a package version? Um, examples of that. So this is, and when we're talking about vocabulary and definitions, there are a lot of overlaps that we can grab from this spec and bring into our world without having to um, rewrite it all. Um, what version is this you're looking at, Steve? This is version uh, 1.2. Um, the version two, 
uh, I found was, like I said, a little bit harder to, they didn't lay out the, um, the definitions quite as cleanly. Yeah. I think Kate mentioned in her email that they're working actually already on now on version three, but that they are looking for, you know, feedback, I guess, and input. So it would yeah. be interesting to but it, here's version two, uh, 2.1 uh, and it has something similar. Um, you know, what, what is a package? What is a supplier? So a lot of the information that we're looking at, uh, the concepts are going to be the same, but um, like for package download location um, in, let's say we're dealing with a Java jar that would make sense that this would be uh, the Maven repository that the jar file is going to come from. Um, so that would be around uh, a jar file that's being packaged. Now, when you create a, a jar file, you don't necessarily have a way to embed SPDX uh, information into it. Um, I'd have to see if they updated the spec to allow it to go into the manifest file. Um, but you get to other languages that are, um, uh, you know, this is going to be information uh, that it's going to be hard to get some of the, the languages to embed it. You're going to have a, a sidecar file that's going to kind of describe it, you know, like in, um, uh, the, in, in the Python world, you have your, was it your requirements.json, I think. Um, one of those files is going to describe it at, at that level. But there is a lot of uh, information that we can uh, utilize. And what we'll need to do is roll this information up or use this information um, to describe an artifact that we see you know, from the CI CD pipeline uh, perspective. So um, for us, we're typically thinking about um, after a CI build, I have a package and that package, let's say I'm going to do a Python um, module, a, a Python executable, or, or, you know, that's going to include, uh, let's do a Node.js. So I have a Node.js um, uh, program and it's going to include so many different packages then I'm gonna have a package of uh, SPDX that's gonna include other SPDXs. So it's kind of this nested cascading effect that you have to roll up the information. Uh, and then if you put that Node.js into a container and then you have uh, multiple other pieces, you have to keep rolling up these relationships um, to get the true representation of what, a, what, is, a, what is in the container. Um, to describe that. So the way I look at it compared to um, what I just described around file, you know, artifacts, um, this is uh, information that's inside of the artifacts and artifacts are then um, at that level are what we move around typically in the CI CD uh, pipeline process. So, so does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we know of any companies that have adopted SPDX in in you know in in real use real world use. Um, most of the uh, open source uh, projects that are under the Linux Foundation have been implementing uh, SPDX. Okay. Yeah, I, I will say it's well worth having the conversation with Kate. Uh, I had a a quick chat with her, and yeah, there's. there's there's the licensing part of SPDX, which is less interesting, but the package management side, and yeah, appreciate that that's pretty complicated. Um, but yeah, I think two, SPDX 2.2 is what's out now, uh, but they are working to 3.0. So we should kind of be aware of what's happening there. And the direction as well, she mentioned is a lot of, the, they're kind of in the, the S bonds space. So, Software Bill of Materials. Uh, for those of you who remember, Kay Williams was doing some work on, on the MITRE side. Uh, I think all those efforts are now rolling into X, SPDX. So they're doing a, a good job of sort of bringing folks together uh, on that space. And I know they're syncing with folks like on the, the Cyclone DX. Um, that being said, I think the specifics of CICD, uh, it's not gonna have that domain knowledge um, and we are the right folks to 
kind of bring that perspective into that. I think it's it's well worth um, working with them and layering on top where we can, uh, just because I think, yeah, from all the indications, it's picking up a lot of momentum um, yeah. in adoption as well across platforms. Yeah, there's a lot of terms in the SPDX world that uh, we can adopt without reinventing them. You know, what is a versioning schema? What is uh, a Git repo? You know, th those those terms are already been defined in, in the SPDX spec, so we can just refer to them instead of creating our own and being, you know, slightly off. I, I would say that we as much as we can adopt from the, the standard, especially since it's being put, put in front of ISO, um, mm -hmm. that will we'll save ourselves a lot of time. Yeah, but, and I expect we should be able to offer recommendations as well for the spec as well as improved tooling. Yeah, and like I said, the, the spec is really what, what I consider low level. It's when I create a package of, um, of code that I want to share. Um, it may not go through a CI CD process, but it is a shareable um, object. And because it's shared, I want to um, attach certain attributes to that. So people understand when they go look at my module, you know, who's the author of it? Where's the website? You know, what are the other dependencies that you need to install uh, to make this uh, this piece run. So, like I said, it's it's for us, it's a little low level um, and we'll need to look at it at a, a roll up uh, perspective. And that's one of the things that we're doing on the Artelia side is, is rolling that up. Um, we're actually bringing in uh, Cyclone DX has some decent tools, um, some of the few open source tools that you can use to scan for uh, SPDX records, as well as other packaging uh, information. Um, and also the Cyclone tools will look for against CVEs uh, as well, uh, go up against the CVE database and kind of co correlate the two together. Um, so that's one of the things that is I found. And then there's another um, tool that I found, it's called the Dependency Track dependencytracker.org, I think. Uh, and they provide a UI to visualize um, what's in a, um, basically when you go gather all these SPDX records and, um, and the other packaging information, you can um, logically group them together into what they call a project. And you can look at all the licenses or all the um, CVEs for your project. Uh, and it gives you that visualization at, at that level. And that's another open source that's project. Fair. A more fundamental question. Um, if we have a, if there is a, uh, an open standard like SPDX uh, already in place, what exactly is it we're trying to uh, define here? Well, that's what, um, as part of the vocabulary, um, that's why I was saying we should, instead of us going through and trying to come up with what we consider is a the definition for a source control repository uh, and we come up with you know subversion get you know whatever um, and we go through our, and do all of our definitions um, that instead of doing that project that we just refer to what's already been done on the SPDX side so I think the goal here is to really come up with what our vocabulary for our CI CD world is. And as part of that, we should borrow as much as we can from something that's, that's proposed to be a standard. And yeah, the other thing Tracy Miranda highlighted is that they may lack the perspective from CI CD domain. So we can, you know, look at what they are doing and see if there are gaps and contribute them there or, you know, but yeah, as Tracy mentioned, like Kate Stewart will join to our meeting 15th of April. So like that would be a great, great opportunity for us to you know hear what they are working with, like version three. Uh, they start working with that and we can share our thoughts and what we are doing within CDF and see what she says. Maybe they already thought about these things, but they may not have, you know, the right contacts or whatever, you know, 
that is like kind of why I brought the SPDX topic up. Yeah, and, and what I found initially is vendors or open source projects are the only thing that they're really putting in the SPDX record is the license uh, at this point. I'm hoping that as people adopt that they're going to start putting in more information, more of the uh, individual records. Um, I have not found anybody that's doing the dependencies yet when you look at the projects. Um, so there's a lot of information in the spec, but uh, people are just doing a couple one-liners uh, in in their in their well, SPDX records that's for now. Totally understandable uh, because uh, there is already uh, you know all, all the systems out there, uh, including I mean you, you mentioned you know JavaScript. When I create an npm module, uh, npm already gives me just a slew of metadata about that module, um, artifactory, uh, and, and those systems that are already uh, uh, stores for any sort of a binary, you know, whether it be jar file or whatever, give you a slew of metadata, as well as anything that adheres to the, to the Docker Hub standard for images that already given, you know, Red Hat with their uh, Quay uh, repository that already gives you everything you would imagine about the image itself. So I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how much value there is with uh, anyone else trying to define a standard for for uh, meta, metadata having to do with those types of artifacts. So all you need to do really uh, at the end of the day is to refer to and say, this is an NPN module. Here's the address for its repository end of story. And then anybody who wants to, create, let's say somebody wants to crawl through uh, various dependencies of a fully fully fledged software system, all they need to know is that, oh, okay, I've got an NPM module, module I've got um, a JavaScript application, I have, here's a uh, Quay address. And if they have adapters for that system, those adapters know exactly what to do to retrieve the metadata from Quay or from NPM or from Artifactory. And that's that. There's really no need to, re to you'd, you'd be reinventing the wheel and, and why do that. So I can totally understand why they don't do that. Well, what, they're, what SPDX is trying to do is define the standards. So you don't have to create an adapter for every um, language. And so it allows the crawling of that metadata to be done easier. So just for example, if, uh, if MPM, you have to use the word creator as the keyword. Um, and in Python, you have to use the word author now you have to have two different adapters, and what the uh, the standards trying to do is is literally standardize. We're, we're going to use author instead of creator um, as SPDX standard across all these different uh, programming languages. So now when we go and crawl this stuff, we're not having to rewrite uh, different adapters and and change switch adapters on the fly as we go through the different uh, languages. Because if you look at a container um, that, and this will, this applies to like RPMs as well um, at the operating system level that the SPDX uh, applies to those. So if I wanna go get a list of all the licenses that are installed in the container and I have some of it's in Node, some of it's in Golang, and then I have my RPMs, I have to have three different, I have to scan it three different times because I had three different standards I had to look for. And the SPDX is trying to um, make it a make it easier to do it just a scan once and get all the, the data that I'm looking for. Yeah, and I totally agree. I think that's a very good idea to have a common common language there to, to set date what on what the artifact attributes are in a common way and not have it specific for language or package type or whatever. And that brings me to a question that I had to you, Steve, on, on your definitions there of, is it five different types of artifacts? 
uh, I was wondering, I guess there are some attributes in those that are the same for all artifact types, right? Uh, so for example, I guess uh, like, like name and path and size are all more or less there for all of them. Would it be feasible then or maybe good even to have a common, some you had a high level artifact definition where these are the, the common attributes for all artifact types. And then we have for these certain types, we have some other uh, attributes as well. Yeah, I was thinking of that where you could do an inheritance model. Um, so you have some base, uh, base, like you said, like name or path would be at the base level. And then like a database would inherit from a file and then, you know, that type of inheritance. Um, that was one of the other ways I was thinking of laying it out, but I wanted to get your feedback and look at, um, you know, this is just like an initial brain dump. And I think there's some uh, scenarios that are some other types of artifacts that I'm not thinking of that we need to look at. Yeah, another way, I guess, to do that instead of having a hierarchy would be that you can have these common attributes as mandatory attributes, and then the other ones could be optional. And depending on what type of artifact you are talking about, those will, of course, not be optional then to you, but they will still be optional in the whatever the metadata schema, schema or something like that. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. So do you do you think there are some of these that are actually optional or do you think all of these are, are mandatory for each artifact type here or? Um, some of them, uh, you know, like the base ones, uh, like name, uh, well, name's the main one version uh, would be the other one. Those would be the two main ones. Uh, size is, uh, you know, a size of a hardware artifact is questionable because we're trying, I, I define a, the, a hardware artifact is basically is a file that describes what the, what is on the hardware. So it's basically a, a, a description of the hardware. Now you could do the size of that file would be another required argument, but that's one of those you know, gray areas. <laughs> Right, right. So what, what is it really that identifies an artifact then? Because I mean, name, of course, could identify it, but at the same time, in a file system, the name could change. And there's there's some file system ID that will not change then. Uh, so I guess some kind of placeholder or some kind of handle, that would mean, uh, that is not, that is immutable for each artifact. Wouldn't that need to be some kind of identity or something of an artifact that does not change that is always immutable for all types of artifacts um i think that would be uh an interesting way to describe an artifact and now i'd have to look at what we need to do is look at what something like the maven repositories because they've been having the most experience around this uh like artifactory uh nexus those those repositories to see what they're doing um at that level because that's who we're what we're really trying to describe the way i look at it is is if i want to go get an artifact what do i need to go get it i need to know the name of it which uh the path the version and then the 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 location um those are like the four things i need in order to to retrieve something now uh the immutable part is where uh, like on the Docker side, you have the digest is the immutable um, ID that you're referring to. I don't know if we can um, get to that on a file type. Um, you possibly could be, could by storing the MD5 of the file um, and use that as the descriptor of it. But those, you know, that that's that's uh, one way that we can um, look at the a unique number to describe an artifact. Yeah, Maybe some I, sort I of thinking, digest. Yeah, in a, in a CD or CICD context, we, we would also need a way to to identify what specific version or uh, uh, yeah version of the artifact that we have run, for example, a test for, or if we want to to rebuild a certain 
integrated artifact based on some baseline or whatever, we need to be able to fetch exactly the same versions uh, to rebuild the same thing again. So we need to know exactly what we have built. And therefore, we need probably the MD5 or SHA uh, or the digest or something like that that identifies the exact version of the artifact we have used. So we need a way to declare that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally something agree. That is immutable then, yeah. Yeah, it, and, and that's the the challenge when you start work looking at files. Um, the SHA MD5 is pretty good. Uh, you know, you, you can get clashes now and then, um, but it's very rare where you can get a clash of two different files having the same MD5. It is possible, theoretically possible, but the chances of it happening are very slim. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, worth considering at least. But it's a good start. Yeah, so if you can add in uh, digest as part of the uh, uh, the attributes for the other artifacts is something that we need to look at tracking. I think that would be a, a good good addition. Excellent. Good good start. Um on this work, great discussion. I think we should move on to uh, Vincent's presentation because we have 20 minutes left in the meeting and I wanna make sure we have time for it. We will discuss um, policy-driven CICD if there is time afterwards, otherwise we'll have to bookmark that for next meeting. Uh, Vincent, would you like to present? Do your demo yes. on, yeah, great. Let's go. Uh, I'm to show my screen. Okay, so um, uh, where do I start? Um, yeah, basically, so uh, I'm working at the Emotion, sorry, uh, for the this introduction, and uh, I'm also a Twin Twin Sex uh, contributor uh, from time to time. Uh, so it's a topic, so I'm going to talk about continuous uh, delivery indicators. Uh, so it's a topic that uh, we wanted to address for a while at the Emotion. And uh, recently, we starting uh, we started to to um, to collect metrics and uh, to put some visualization visualization uh, for it using Grafana. Um, and at the same time, uh, there was another uh, track, other people uh, at work um, starting to collect uh, feeling of developers. Uh, so it started a year ago uh, with uh, the current situation. Um, and when the so yeah so all the work I did uh, to collect the metrics and uh, to to visualize them using Grafana uh, has been put in open source and is being integrated has been integrated into Jenkins Sex uh, so it's been finalized uh, these days. Um, and yes, the interesting part is that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, when the, the article about the space framework uh, came out, uh, we found it very interesting. We found that it was very interesting uh, because it makes uh, the two efforts we are trying to do, uh, like at the same time collect uh, system metrics to see uh, how our application and CI/CD platform was doing. Like this is an example, for example, uh, for one single repository. Uh, so we can easily see uh, which version has been uh, released, deployed in staging or production. If we have undeployed release in production, for example, and for a specific time range, uh, so for example, for uh, the last two weeks, so the last um, sprint, we have a sprint of two weeks. We can see the number of contributors, review pull request, uh, mean time to review, for example, uh, percentage of uh, deployed release in production, which is uh, quite low for this uh, application. Uh, yeah, lots of uh, things like release interval, deployment interval, uh, and more technical uh, metrics too for indicators, uh, such as the uh, mean duration for the pipeline, uh, pipeline failure, and things like that. Uh, so it's not finished. We we have other uh, indicators we we'd like to track and to add, uh, of course. Um, and as I said, at the same time, we had uh, some people started to put some internal framework uh, to collect uh, developers' productivity and feeling um, at the end of each uh, sprint. So this is an example. 
um, where we can see for a, a small team, for example, uh, what these are thing uh, in terms of screen deficiency, workload balance, personal balance, and so on. Um, so this is where the space framework uh, came into play. So I don't know if you have time to, to, to read it or not. If you didn't, uh, it's very a good investment to read it. Very interesting. Um, and so basically, it's uh, a framework that uh, split uh, metrics in two categories. Uh, the metrics you can collect from the system, uh, such as uh, what we are doing with uh, Jenkins X, collecting events from the cluster or from uh, the Git system, like pull request events and so on. And the survey metrics that you can collect from uh, asking questions to the developers. Uh, and into five categories, uh, satisfaction, performance, activity, communication, and efficiency, uh, so space. Uh, on a different level, so individual, team or group, and the system. And we can put some metrics in different uh, uh, category and level. And uh, what we'd like to do, so it's still a work in progress, uh, continuously improving and so on. What we'd like to do is to, to, to be able to, uh, at the end of the sprint, for example, uh, to mix uh, both uh, the system data we can collect uh, and visualize through Grafana with uh, what we, the survey data that we can ask uh, developers. So it's a big complex in our situation because we have uh, teams that are working across multiple uh, repository. Uh, we don't have uh, the one repository or one team per repository, so it's, uh, it's more complex, uh, but we'll try to manage something. So, um, uh, yeah, so we can have a view, different view uh, of the system metrics. So this is for, uh, sorry, that one was for a single repository. Uh, we have another one for the whole platform, for example, where we can see which application, for example, are uh, have undeployed release and the global uh, activity uh, yeah, and so on. And uh, I try to, to group that uh, into the different category of the space framework. Uh, so it's not finished, it's just a uh, work in progress. Just trying to put some uh, some graph into different uh, categories, such as performance, activity, and so on. So not really nice yet, but um, it will come. Um, and uh, what else? Yes, as I said, uh, we've open source that uh, in the Jenkins X uh, project. So it's not enabled uh, by default yet, uh, but it's just uh, easy to, to enable. And uh, the goal is that people using Jenkins X uh, can benefit from these uh, indicators that will be automatically collected from the system and displayed in Grafana. Uh, and they can uh, yeah, add more and continue. So uh, how it works internally, uh, we have a small Go application which is collecting uh, events from the Kubernetes uh, cluster, uh, such as uh, the Jenkins X uh, release and uh, pipeline, which, has, uh, which are uh, custom resource uh, definition for Kubernetes. Uh, and we are also collecting uh, GitHub events or whatever Git system you are using, um, such as uh, the pull request events, uh, deployment events, uh, for example, using uh, GitHub API, which has uh, an API for deployments. Um, and we are doing that through uh, Lighthouse, which is a sub project of uh, Jenkins X. Uh, so we don't have to, to listen directly to the, the upstream uh, Git system, for example. Uh, we get the events forwarded by uh, Lighthouse. So it's just a plugin for Lighthouse. Uh, so that works well for Jenkins X. In fact, it can be uh, easily adapted to a uh, different uh, system uh, because that's the beauty of uh, Kubernetes is that uh, everything is an event. You can watch for a lot of things. Um, and when you are uh, practicing GitOps, it's the same with your Git system. So you can easily um, uh, collect uh, all kinds of uh, events. Uh, so our small uh, collector uh, is then going to store everything in a simple um, PostgreSQL database. So for example, we have our release, uh, pull request, uh, when it was created, ready for review, merge, and so on. 
uh, all the pipeline, uh, the status, time to, to run, and so on, and deployments, uh, which environment, which version, uh, and so on. And uh, after that, we can use Grafana to, to, to extract all the data and put some nice visualization. And the nice part is that uh, you can mix multiple data sources with Grafana. So we can have one dashboard for an application where we can have uh, uh, metrics or indicators for, uh, for the CI-CD part of the application, like, uh, uh, for example, the time to review, um, uh, time to merge, or to, time to release, and so on. Uh, and you can also have uh, your uh, logs from your uh, application uh, running in your production system, uh, your Prometheus metrics uh, from your application, and so on. So you can get a, a high uh, overview of, um, of everything for one application, which is pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, basically that's it. Uh, so if you have question. I have a question. You said you asked the developers questions. Um, how often do you ask them a question? Do you do that daily or like only at the end of like a sprint? Yes, at the end of each sprint. So every two weeks for us. Okay. So it's, it's something we started to do. So some teams started to do it. Uh, I've been doing that for a while, uh, but almost all the team are doing it for uh, one year now. Got it. And it's something we continue to do because it's very interesting to get, uh, to get that kind of feedback. And uh, what is even more interesting, of course, is to merge it uh, with uh, the system metrics you can collect. Uh, so that we can see, for example, uh, in the example I had, uh, like all the developers said, uh, they felt it was a very efficient uh, sprint. So we can see uh, maybe the system metrics that it was efficient too. Uh, otherwise, there is something wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, like you said, to merge the, the data because uh, it helps put some context around the raw data that you're collecting. That's very nice. Yeah, no, great initiative and love the dashboard. The, the space framework, that's something we started looking at in the end user console. And yeah, I, I've read through it. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Have you looked at all? Um, I, know, I don't know if you've seen the, the Four Keys project um, from Google on the, the Dora metrics itself. Is... Yes, yes, it was what we initially wanted to do. Um... But we're not really finished with uh, all the metrics we want to collect, the indicators we want to display on some. But yes, it was our initial goal. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, and I'm curious if that kind of works for you or there's some integrations to be made there as well. Uh, the initial metric we wanted to, to, to collect and, and display uh, was the mean lead time. But in fact, uh, so it's something I didn't talk about, but. In fact, it was too big for us. Like it, uh, we wanted initially to have um, uh, indicators that we can uh, act on. Uh, so for example, we, can, we are collecting uh, and displaying the, the time for review. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's much easier to understand for people and to, to act on it. Since the mean lead time, which is like too big, it, it has too, too, too many steps in it. Uh, yeah. So it's a good, it's good indicator to track uh, to give a high overview, but yeah. uh, we need other indicators too uh, that we can act on. So yeah, and I didn't, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't finish the the the, the visualization part to, to to display the the minute time because yeah, I just need to to, uh -huh. to put a nice a simple view uh, to be able to merge some some data. And, yeah. But that's something we want to have too uh, because it's a good indicator. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is pretty good. I'd love, love to see how you keep evolving it. Sure. Uh, quick question. Uh, what, what is, uh, what, what's the dependency on, uh, on Jenkins X specifically to, with this system that you've come up with? Um, so uh, we are collecting the events we are collecting from the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we are collecting uh, custom resource definitions that have been defined by, by uh, Jenkins X. So for example, the pipeline uh, custom resource definition uh, or the release pipeline definition. 
But in fact, it can be something else. For example, uh, we don't have to try the pipeline uh, CRD. We can try, uh, because the Jenkins-X is built on top of Tecton, we can try uh, Tecton's uh, pipeline run, and it will be similar. Uh, the release, we can also watch for uh, Git uh, release events. Um, Let me refuse my question. Maybe that, that'll make it become more clear. Um, if I wasn't using Jenkins X, um, can I deploy your, uh, your system and define its input points somehow or where, where its events are coming from? If I'm not using Jenkins X, can I do that? Uh, right now, no. But okay. in fact, it's, uh, it, it, well, it's, it's not the most complex part. Uh, what if I'm using Tecton under the covers? Sorry? What if I'm using Tecton pipelines? I'm, I'm, I've got pipeline runs. I have task runs. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah I, it's, I can uh, use this. I, can I deploy it and have it be watching those events? Yeah, you need to change your code, uh, but it's not. Uh, I can show you if you want the code. You will see how easy it is. Uh, there is somewhere. So let's say, for example, the pipeline. So yeah, you see, I'm uh, I'm hooked into the Jenkins X API, uh, but the code is like uh, 100 line to collect the pipeline. Uh, so it's just uh, it's just a small uh, small controller, uh, Kubernetes controller that will watch for uh, specific events um, and uh, yeah and store that in a in a PostgreSQL database. So it's easy to change that. Uh, we can even make uh, make one that that can listen to either uh, okay. Python pipeline run or Jenkins Stack pipeline activity. Okay, now are these events uh, the the cloud events that Tecton emits, or are these Jenkins X events? Uh, these are uh, Jenkins X events, uh, okay. events but uh, it's built on top of uh, Tecton. So the pipeline is the Jenkins X pipeline activity is a Jenkins X representation of a pipeline, which is kind of the equivalent of the pipeline run, kind of. <laughs> there I understand. are a bit more things in it. I understand. I, I'm, I'm wondering um, if it would be helpful to or would be valuable to adapt this to the underlying pipeline mechanism, which is really Tecton itself. And this is something when we are we are using Tecton uh, in eBay, and uh, our, our next generation CD system will be completely based on that. And um, this, something like this, this kind of a, a metrics gathering, automatic metrics gathering, would be huge. It would be awesome. Maybe we can contribute to. Um, to this project. Is this something that's, is this an open source project that you have? Yes. Uh, I put the link in the notes. Uh, you have a link in the, uh, in the HackMD document? By yes, yeah, yes, the link is, is already there. I see it, all right. Uh, but uh, yes, it will be. Okay. I, was, I was gonna say, it's, it's almost like we should get someone to standardize all the events so we can put a dashboard on it. <laughs> make this all work. But, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> the tech uh, yeah, totally. It will be easier with the with standardized events. Yeah, the, the Tecton folks have already, uh, well, uh, we have Antonio here. I think we, he can talk about that. He's, it's, it's already, uh, I'm sorry, Andrea uh, here. Uh, he can talk about that. Uh, the uh, cloud events are already being emitted uh, for Tecton events are cloud events, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. Exciting. Uh, uh, I think when you see the dashboards like yours, Vincent, it, it starts to see all the power of bringing all these things together and uh, just kind of making it work. This, for, is actually, this is something we might actually uh, be able to use uh, if, but we would have to, we would have to, uh, how should I say, D Jenkins exit, you know, excise it, <laughs> so that it's that it's relying on the underlying cloud events versus yeah. the Jenkins X events. But it would be very helpful if that's the case. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good uh, a good project, as I'm sure. Uh, the other interesting part will be uh, how to 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 get uh, events from the Git system, 
so in the context of Jenkins insects, it's easier because we have Lighthouse, uh, which is, uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with Lighthouse, but it's uh, a system that does all the interaction between uh, Peyton and everything that happens inside the Jenkins X cluster and the external uh, Git uh, repositories, uh, which are hosted on GitHub or uh, Bitbucket or whatever. Uh, so it's an abstraction, and uh, we can write a Lighthouse plugin uh, that will uh, just get, uh, get the events from Lighthouse. So we don't have to register a webhook on GitHub or uh, whatever else, uh, and yeah, and all the different kind of systems. So that's pretty nice. Um, so yes, we'll need, if we go for uh, something else, we'll need a uh, a way to, 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 to get events from GitHub and all these kind of systems. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take a look at the uh, your, your, your project uh, and see how we can maybe start to contribute to that to, to make it more generic. Yeah, or maybe start a new one. Maybe we can uh, like just keep this one as a, the first initiator and get a new one that will be more generic um, yeah. as a CDF level. I think that's good. And then we'll be able to maybe to switch and then some things yeah, this uh, project is, to use the generic one. This is great. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, feel free to ping me if you want some help. I'll be happy to help. Uh, of course, of course. Good. Yeah, I let you uh, under it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vincent. That was a fantastic presentation again. Um, yeah, it's really interesting pulling in the different data sources and then the wider picture you get. That's pretty fantastic. Um, any more questions for Vincent before we wrap up today? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, we're just over time. So um, we will wrap up today's meeting. Great presentations and discussions today. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting when we will be talking. Uh, Fati, do you want to go over Kate? Uh, Kate Stewart will be joining us. Is this yeah, correct? 15th of April, she will mm -hmm. join us and we will continue our standardized meta discuss metadata discussion with her. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, that's good. I feel like that got cut short a little bit, so it's good we can continue on that. Great. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a very good uh, long weekend. Right, I hope you're going to enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.